Yeah, if you're in a survival situation, dump, don't dump the water out of your can of tuna. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> but I'm not, so I don't want soupy tuna. One thing we all fail to mention when we're, we're out here doing this stuff is, uh, for one, don't forget about your old trusty companions, the Swiss Army knife. This is the uh, Swiss Army Forester with the Ranger grip handles. It's got a longer blade on it and the uh, one-handed opening, which with carpal tunnel I can never seem to do. And it's got that nice little can opener on it. It's funny, I use that can opener in the kitchen more than I use my regular can opener. Um, and then I just keep it secured on a lanyard with a hook on it, a little clasp. So when I'm sitting down and stuff, it doesn't fall out of my pocket and it doesn't get lost. But there's plenty of times I, you'll find me out and I just carry a couple cans of tuna or ramen noodle or something. And then I get this uh, Weber garlic sriracha seasoning. They sell it at Lowe's near the grilling stuff. I really like that stuff. It's uh, basically a chicken seasoning uh, for grilling, but like a rub, but I like it on my food. And then I got my fork. <laughs> but um, one thing that we, what I was getting at, what we fail to mention a lot of times when we're doing this stuff is uh, you feel the slightest bit of hunger when you're out working. My dad and I always followed this philosophy when we worked together. As soon as you get hungry, eat. Because when you're messing with dangerous tools or out and about hiking around in muddy, rainy woodlands and everything, uh, you'll lose your senses if you're not used to not eating. Now, and move that camera up a bit. Yeah, let's see here. That'll work. I'll eat while I'm talking to you before we get to the fire pit. But a lot of people are, will go by philosophy. Well, you can go weeks without food. You can go days without water. Why would you if you don't have to? doesn't make any sense You're just tormenting yourself um, you may be able to go your body may be able to survive weeks without food but I dare you to go two days without eating and see how well you function or grow th go through the uh, a solid work day doing some physical tasks especially if you're not used to heavy labor with a couple hours of being hungry, dare you to do it. But I'll tell you this, when my dad and I were working together, we were running all these cemeteries. We these guys that come out, and they do uh, grave digging for us and stuff because we didn't feel like digging it by hand. These kids show up, I say kids, they're usually teenagers. Once you learn how to dig a hole, pretty simple to dig a hole and fill it back in. Um, they come out and they hadn't eaten lunch or they talk about getting something to eat after they were done. Uh, digging a hole eight feet long and three feet wide and typically four or five feet deep. They weren't six feet deep like a lot of people think. Um, Going through heavy rock, it's a lot of work. So, my dad and I would make sandwiches up and take them out to them while they were working. And it was because we had witnessed so many times people sprained an ankle, broke a leg, threw their shoulder out, whatever it may have been, from falling into the hole because they lost their footing. Or took an electric jackhammer straight through their boot because they were off balance or trying to rush you know because your mind's thinking about food water and that kind of thing and even when my dad was landscaping I'd go out and help him on job sites he worked for a company I'd show up and help him out on the really hot days 
because I knew my dad worked by himself a lot. Heavy equipment and doing stuff and I'd go out and make him take a break and I'd bring extra food and water and beverages and stuff to him. And then I'd help him with the work. But when we were running our own crews, we went and uh, on the really hot days, we wouldn't allow, allow our guys to work for more than 30 minutes at a time. 30 minutes on, five to 10 minute break, because it was dangerous. So one thing you'll never find me doing is working with axes and stuff and saws and moving logs and those kind of things or doing woodcraft even on an empty stomach. Never going to happen. I've seen way too many accidents happen as a result of people not properly taking care of themselves. Now today, we're going to use our hatchet to um, carve our, our posts for our fire pit. Now, one thing I'd recommend you bring with you is just a small, it doesn't have to be an expensive one, a small tape measure. Um, if you don't know how to measure with your axe or whatever. Because you want you want your pieces, the logs that you're going to put as the wall of your fire pit and the um, posts to be roughly the same length. Now we're only pounding these posts about a foot into the ground. We just want them to be stable. Um, we're going to use our pilot stick to start the hole and then we're going to drive our posts the rest away in the ground. My hope is, is that I could just use my axe to pound them into the ground because uh, it's kind of wet and soft today. Um, but if I can't, we'll have to make another tool. We'll have to make a maul or something of that nature. I have a heavy hammer out here, which you can use, a heavy sledge. Um, but I think it's good to learn these axe skills as much as possible. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather up my resources that I need. Um, which is going to be mostly locust trees because I have so many locust saplings around here that are very invasive and I'm trying to clear them out for like tulip poplar and some other trees to be able to grow better. Um, so I have tons of locusts and walnut saplings all over the place here. Um, so those are main primarily the woods I'm using. For my firewall itself, my thermal wall, um, I'm using just logs from a locust tree that I cut down. It wasn't very big, maybe about 10 inches in diameter. And what I do is I stack, I start with the, the biggest part first, meaning close to the base of the tree first. And it's going to be the length of um, the width of my fire pit, pit basically. Um, I don't need it to be any longer than that, and I don't want it to really be too much shorter than that. It could be a little bit shorter. I'm just looking to center it, basically. Um, from there, I'm going to take the next part of the tree that I cut off and stack that on top, then the next part and stack that on top. We only need about three or four logs high. It, it, it doesn't need to be very tall at all, okay? Because we dug our pit down in, so we already have that 10-inch um, depth from the spade of our shovel, basically, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go gather the posts, and I'm going to do three of them and get them in the ground. Um, and then I'm going to show you, on the fourth one, I'm going to show you how I, I managed to carve that, that point and drove it into the ground and such. And then we're going to lash it together. But we're going to use a lash that I don't see typically used for a fire pit. A lot of times I'll see like a square lash or, you know, people just run a string back and forth to tie their posts, squeeze their posts together. Um, we're going to use a different method because what happens over time is wood shrinks. So those logs, though it'll take time, they will shrink. And what will happen is your posts will get loose right, and become unstable and wobbly. Not too bad, but bad enough. And I want to be able to adjust that over time if I need to. Um, so I'm going to make a device um, that's very, very simple. If you have a pocket knife, you can make this device, and you'll need cordage. Um, I'm using number 36 bank line more than likely because I have it in my bag. Um, you can use paracord, but paracord will melt under heat at, at a certain point if you get your fire too hot, uh, where the bank line holds up pretty good. Um, and plus the bank line is, uh, it doesn't stretch as much. Par paracord gets slippery and begins to stretch over time. Um, so I'm going to use bank line for that, um, Tard Mariner's bank line for that, um, number 36, because it's stronger than the 12 and the 8 that I have. 
uh, but you can pretty much use anything as your cordage. Now, before I get started, I'm going to show this to you, but before I get started, basically what you're going to want to do is get your biggest log that <laughs> people ringing me while I'm in the woods. How cute is that, huh? Don't know them. <laughs> so you're going to get the, your first log, the biggest one, and you're going to lay it on the ground and position it right where you would want it to be. And we're going to keep it back a little bit from the edge of our fire pit. We're not going to put our posts right into our fire pit. We're going to put them about six inches back from our fire pit. So we're going to figure that out. We're going to grab our post, set it on the ground, roll our log up next to it, and figure out how much space we need on each side to drive our posts in. Uh, we're going to keep them in on the log a bit. So from the end of your, your biggest log that you're going to lay on the ground as your base, you're going to bring that in about six to eight inches, your post. Okay, so you have a log here, and your post is going to come down right here on each end. Just the first two there. Once you get that log in place and it's butted up against those two posts, you've pounded them into the ground, you're going to butt it up against two posts and pound your next ones in. Now you're going to keep them tight up against that log, um, but you want to kind of make sure they're not bowing out like this. If anything, have them come in a little bit like this, okay? Um, because the next log you put on, if you're doing like I am, using it from the same tree and gradually stepping up the tree to get your next log, um, you're going to want to make sure that when it goes down in there, it's not going to be too loose in there, right? There will be some play because trees aren't perfect. Like even the locust that I'm using, some of the logs are a little bit crooked. And I'm just going to adjust it to make sure there's not too much space in between. Now keep in mind that we're going to use a lot of the dirt that we, we're going to use all the dirt that we dug out of the fire pit to push up against the back of this wall. Now if you find you put your log across your fire pit and maybe one end is higher than the other or um, maybe the ground is a little uneven on one end and it feels like it's going to roll or rock, take some of that dirt and tuck it up underneath that log up underneath the end and get it level or dig some off the other side and move it to the low side. That way um, you can level that thing up pretty good so it's not going to rock all around on you. Now keep in mind that these logs, they won't last forever. They'll last for a long time if you get nice, good, hardwood, thick logs, um, but they're not going to last forever. They will rot over time. That's okay. Um, we're not too concerned about that. Um, if you want to uh, prevent rot, this is something I'm not going to do because I'm using locusts and it would take me forever to get it done. Uh, you could peel the bark off of it. Um, that'll keep beetles and termites and things like that from really boring their way into the wood. Um, do not coat these logs with diesel or oil to, to preserve them simply because you're going to have them next to the fire and you don't want that thing to go up like a Roman candle, right? So um, these are just some things I wanted to mention before we got started. Um, I'm using a cheap hardware store uh, buck saw that's over there where my fire pit is. Um, they're like six to eight dollars. You don't really, I'm, I'm making a fixed camp, so that saw is gonna stay here. Um, you can use your folding saw. I would suggest that you wanna think about the size of these logs and how long it's going to take you. Now, I'm using the box saw to cut my posts, but as you know, I was clearing locusts from my field one day, and I used a chainsaw to cut those things down and cut them to length. Why? Because I want this done. Um, I don't want to be hours cutting with buck saws and stuff through locusts, uh, one of the hardest woods available to me. Um, so I used a chainsaw, and man, that stuff did dull my blade, trust me. Um, so use your best judgment, be, in a, be an adult about it, or at least be mature about it. Now behind me, there's a log laying on the ground. I could easily cut that log up, and I'll show you. I could easily cut this log right here up and use that for the same purpose, which I may cut that log up someday and use it for that purpose. Maybe back here around this fire pit, I might do the same exact thing. And that's close. I mean, my fire pit's like 10 feet away, 10, 15 feet away um, near my hunting style camp. So that log's perfect for this type of thing. And it just fell down not too long ago, the beginning of the year. Um, so it's not hollow or anything inside that I know of. Um, I can find any dead standing trees that still look rather green, which I have a couple over that way, a few, about 15 yards over that way. I could cut those down, 
safety issue anyway, get those out of the way and cut those up and use them for these purposes. So I'm not looking to cut down a great looking green tree for this stuff. I'm trying to find down logs to use for this. Um, I'm lucky enough that I've, I had these locusts that already needed to be removed. Um, and the reason they needed to be removed is because locusts are like weeds, man. They'll start growing through our field like crazy. And it doesn't take long before you got these trees um, pushing your fence line and everything. And that's why there's no fence up there. It's because the locust trees are growing. Nobody's taking care of them. And it ripped the fences apart, basically. Um, but they don't belong there. Um, they tend to break and fall in the weather. And then I end up having a mess to clean up. So I'm using them. I'm recycling that resource. I'm upcycling, basically. Um, what I want you to keep in mind is, is make sure that you at least have permission to do these things. So if you're on private property and the landowner said, yeah, you can make your camp and everything, make sure they're okay with you building this fire pit and cutting up the logs and things like that. Because if it's in a country setting or anything, a lot of these farmers will use those down trees as their firewood for the winter time. And they just may not have seen it or gotten to it yet, but they will walk through their woods. And if they find that you use their good firewood for, for your fire pit, or they assume that you cut down a live tree to do this stuff without permission, they're going to get pretty angry with you. Um, on state game lands, not a good idea to be cutting down trees, uh, but if you find some downed logs, I don't see anything wrong with it. Just clean up your mess when you're done, and you may not be able to leave it as a permanent camp. If you're on your own piece of property, which it doesn't take a very big piece of property to be able to do this, what I'd suggest to you is if you don't have any downed logs, don't cut down trees call a local tree cutter or somebody like that and say, hey, I'm looking for a few decent 8 to 10 inch logs uh, that I could use for some projects at my house. Do you have any? And if you do, you know, it could be junk wood. It doesn't have to be, you know, prime maple or oak or things that you would, you know, give people for firewood. It could be just locusts, black locusts or something like that. If you have any of that, um, could I pay you to drop it off at my house, right? And then you cut it into lengths and haul it out to your woods or whatever. Um, most of the reason I do this kind of thing on my own property, really, well, I want to enjoy my property as much as possible. Um, you know, I want to teach you, and I have this good location to do it. But it's to clean things up. Um, I drive my tractor through the woods. I, you know, uh, my nephews come over and they ride their quads and their dirt bikes and stuff. They don't rip things up, but they like to come out to the woods, go camping, and they bring their dirt bikes and quads. Um, I don't want there to be any hazards on the trail or anything that could possibly fall on them. Uh, we hunt in these woods and people pass through this property, not with permission, but they do. And I want to make sure that they're not going to get hurt from a dead standing tree or, you know, logs that are on the ground and things like that. Um, not everybody uses the same common sense that we all do when we're walking through the wild and we're looking at the treetops or we're looking to see if there's any dead standing and we're being very wary of these things. Um, like right here where I have this hammock set up, these super strong walnut trees around me. Um, there's no dead standing anything here. There's nothing with the potential of breaking. Now, if you go down that way, there's perfect trees to do hammock camping from. And if you weren't very experienced, you'd tie off on those and you get to camping. And you'd find out in the middle of the night, those trees that you tied to came down that looked super strong and crushed you in the middle of the night because they're dead. Uh, there's not much life left to them, and they got big bore holes in them and stuff. So just use common sense throughout this process. I know this is a small um, project that we're doing, and I've extended it to the point where you're like, man, Bob, when are we going to finish this fire pit? Um, I want you to learn axe safety. I want you to learn to be using these tools properly. For everything that we do on these simple, somewhat simple projects, um, it's teaching you tool control, tool maintenance, um, how to use these tools in many different ways for other projects that we're going to do that aren't so simple, that are more complicated. And I want you guys to enjoy this experience to your fullest. I want you to be very confident when you go into the forest with this tool. I want you to be very confident when you put that sheath knife on your belt or that pocket knife in your pocket. I want you to be very confident knowing that no matter what the weather does, it was just storming here a little while ago. No matter what it does, you can still be out there having a good time, even if it's pouring down the rain and everything. Because you brought your fire bag, you brought your shelter kit with you. 
Um, there are things that you can do and practice while you're out there, even if you didn't plan on doing it because of the weather. Okay. So, um, yeah, just some things I wanted to say, a little conversation, because I don't talk too much while I'm working. And, uh, the next part's going to be fairly short when I show you how to, uh, um, create these posts and, and drive them into the ground and lash them, that kind of thing. All right. See you in the next clip. All right, folks, so we're going to put the posts up. I already got three of them up for our fire pit, and we're going to lay the logs. But before we do that, I want to go over a couple things. In a previous video, a while back, a couple months ago, I did a need a tool, make a tool video. We were making these strops with the uh, Lansky sharpener inside. Now, those aren't crucially important, but we're going to need the strop. And if you got an axe or any kind of outdoorsy woodcraft tools you should get a puck whether it's Lansky or some of the other brands now when I'm sharpening my axe I don't I don't put anything on my puck I don't put water on it I don't put anything if I have big notches in my axe or the 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 edge is really folded over or I'm reprofiling it I'll use the coarse side but generally I just use the fine side and here's how I do it you just hold it against yourself I'll try to get an angle here that you can see and I'm just looking for the edge I can find it when I hear this sound, just like that. If it's this, that's not the edge. It's scratching a little bit. So I'm going to go with it in circular motions like this all the way up to the corner, being careful not to go over top of the edge and flattening it. And I do this every few minutes of heavy use. That way I don't have to re-sharpen my axe, I'm just honing it. So I'm holding it against my belly on this side. And I'm just catching that edge right with the cheek of the axe, right with that bevel. So I'm keeping with the bevel that's already there. And you see, just by that, I'm getting kind of this nice glossy edge here. I'll go back to the other side one more time. I'm just putting a little bit of firm pressure on it, not too firm. I don't want to slide my fingers across that axe blade. And then once I'm done with that, when we're sharpening and honing our knives, we take our knife to the strop. But when we're doing an axe, we take the strop to the axe. So with the stone, I'm sharpening towards the cutting edge. With the strop, I'm going away from it. So for all you kids out there that have never done this before or grown-ups alike that want to teach your kids, it's as simple as this. Nice and firm. Don't go over the edge like this. We're just going with it until we feel a scratch on the leather. And I put some polishing compound on there that you can find at pretty much any hardware store. And I'm just going to go just like that all the way down the edge until I'm happy with the edge. It doesn't have to be hair popping sharp, paper cutting sharp. I want it to be able to cut wood, primarily for the woodcraft tasks that we're doing. Now, generally when I'm done with my ax like this, because I keep it honed, it is pretty much hair popping sharp. So just a two or three minutes of general maintenance. We're in really good shape. There you go. All right. Uh, get that off there now. <laughs> but I just want to feel and make sure there's no, I'm plucking, I'm plucking on the edge, making sure there's no ragged edge there. It's just a razor sharp edge. I want to make sure it'll cut thumbnail all the way down without skipping a beat. Just like that. So if I drag it, it should be able to turn nail into powder, basically. So I want to see all that dust all the way up and down the blade. That way I know it's sharp, okay? Um, so I bring a strop and a stone with me every time. Now while we're doing this, the rest of this project here, you'll see, see if I turn it, 
And you see, I already got that post up, those two posts up, and this one up. And this locust, let me tell you, it's some hard stuff. No joke, I'm breaking a sweat like crazy here. So what I'm doing is, I'm using one of my logs that I'm going to be using on my fire pit as my anvil. So I didn't have to drag a stump over here. Because it's over at the other side of the camp. And all I'm doing, let me get far back enough so you can see. I wonder if I can zoom in a bit for you. Let me see here. Yeah, I can do it like that. Or not. <laughs> well, you can see, right? Yeah. Okay, so all I'm doing is, when I cut my sapling, this sapling gave me two posts for my fire pit. So I had to cut two saplings, all right, before it started getting real crooked on me. Um, I want to use the skinnier end for my spike, and I want to keep the thicker end up top. The reason is, is I'm going to be pounding this with something heavy, and it's going to mushroom. It's going to smash and might even split from the top, so I have a better chance of hitting that big surface than this little one, and I have less pointing work to do down here on a smaller surface. So this would be towards the top of the tree. And this other side here would be towards the base of the tree. This is actually right where I cut the tree off. So all I'm going to do is give this thing a little lean. And it's like we did our pilot stick. I'm just going to let the axe do the work. Tap it. Go about 8 to 10 inches up. You can go 12 inches up if you have soft enough ground to pound it into. We're just going to get all that bark off there to begin with. Once again, just let the axe do the work. It's heavy for a reason. And the handle's made the way it is for a reason. Going in on an angle, straight down. We'll worry about the point once we get this stuff cleaned off. Come across any knots? Ah. Uh, Best to stay away from them if you can if you're on using something like locust or a really hard wood like cherry. Because uh, you're probably going to fold the edge on your axe. Alright, so now we have it squared off. It's in kind of an octagonal shape. And I'm going to go for the ridges. Meaning the high spots, the corners that I just made. I'll worry about the point as I go. Once I get this taken care of, I'm basically making a round, right? Anywhere where there's a ridge, I'm going to get rid of it. You have a better chance of pounding a round spike into a hole than you do a square spike. Trust me on that. All right, so I got it rounded off. Next thing I'm going to do is give it a good lean, and I'm going to go for this edge. I'm going right down to the heartwood on this one. Now bear with me because I have carpal tunnel so it's hard to hold on to the axe sometimes. My arm swells up, my wrist. Just take your time. And if you need to use gloves while you're doing this or you need to take a break, do it. Alright, we'll get back right to it. Alright, so you guys, you can probably tell by the look at me, I'm still not 100% over uh, lime. I'm hurting a little bit, but that's alright. Um, so, when we're done with that, you should have four stakes. They got a decent point on it. They don't have to be perfectly pointed, but get as close as you can. This locust, I tell you, once you get to that heartwood, it's like a rock and this stuff keeps getting harder over time that's why we use it as fence posts it turns like concrete you won't want to cut this after a couple weeks of it laying and this stuff I just cut down today that stuff that's for the fire pit on the the bigger logs I cut that a couple months ago I won't even want to try to tear through that with an axe right now trust me um, on the top side if you didn't quite get a a straight cut on your top if it's leaning like this, you might want to mushroom this. So you might want to take these edges off and round it off on the top. Um, I'm going to use a sledge, a small sledge. 
to pound this in like this. This is about, oh, five pounds, three, three, what is this? Four pound sledge, okay? Um, I keep this out here all the time. It's next to my fire kit. Um, the only thing we never want to use these metal ones and our axes for is pounding on something that's that's uh, like our chisels. We don't want to do that. We want to use wood on our chisels. Uh, I would never take this and pound on my axe head with that. I'd end up destroying my axe. Uh, this is just for general maintenance. Now, if these poles end up being too tall for you, once you lash it all together, just cut them off at the top if you care about that kind of thing. I'm personally going to leave them as is, but and I'm not even sure if it's going to be too tall yet. So what I'm going to do, it's pretty simple actually. Let me see if I can get a little bit closer there for you. Yeah. So for each one of these, I take my pilot stick, right, that we made the other day. And you notice we just did the same exercise that we did with this. We did on the ends of these poles here, right? That's the main reason I was having you start with that. It's a smaller project. What we want to do is my pole's about two and a half inches in diameter, three inches in diameter. So I'm not going to want to go right up against my log with this pilot stick. I'm going to go in line with my other pole, but I'm going to come out, oh, about an inch or so. Maybe two, inch and a half. Let's call it that, all right? Then I'm just going to take it. I'm going to line it up with my other post, and I'm just going to drive it in as straight as I can. I'm going to get it down in there as far as I can, too. Unless you're messing with really sweat, <laughs> soft ground. Um, you know, 6 to 8 inches, 6 to 10 inches is usually pretty good. If you can get it down in a foot, that would be even better. Some, there's a lot of rock under here. So I got that down in there. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take this gently. I'm going to push it back and forth towards the log, away from the log, that direction, and towards me. And I'm going to pack that hole so when I pull this thing out, all that dirt's not going to fall down in there. So basically, we just made a pilot hole. So next thing I'm going to do is just take my post, the pointy end down, slide it right into that pilot hole there. And I'm going to try to make it so if, if my post is bent, I'm going to bend it towards the log. Same on the other side. My posts were bent. I'm bending them. I'm making the bent part towards the log. Okay, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. This post, you can't really tell on the camera, but it's got a curve to it here. I'm going to make sure that's facing my log. So it's kind of wrapping itself around there. I'll let you get closer here for a second. Let me just set that up real quick. I'll show you. Since I made my pilot hole a couple inches away from the main log, my post is right up against it. Let me see there. There we go. Right there. It's right up against that log. So when I pound that in, that's going to tighten up, right? Now my other logs are going to be slightly smaller than this one because I took it from a tree. This was the base of the tree. The next part's going to be the next part I cut off and then the next part. And they get narrower as the tree gets taller, right? So now all I'm going to do, I'm going to use my gumption and I'm a left-handed swinger so I'm going to get on that other side here and I'm going to I use my right hand to hold the thing but I swing kind of left-handed like baseball right all I'm going to do start with gentle taps to get it set you hear that locust it's hard right and this stuff tends to split when you hit it with metal sometimes then I'm just going to I'm basically hitting this right on the heartwood, right in the center. And you can feel with this metal hammer, this is hot right now from hitting that, okay? That should be good enough. I'd like for it to be a bit more in line with that other one, but this should be good. So next thing we're going to do, man, am I getting old or tired, huh? Next thing we're going to do is stack the logs. Let me get the camera adjusted here for you. All right. I get to lift logs now. Yay. So next one that's going to be, I'm looking for the straightest one I got. There's obviously going to be some crooks and turns and branches coming off of them. 
So I'm going to look for the biggest, straightest one. It's usually the next one up. That will be this one. And if I have any, if I have any stubs coming off the side of it, I'm going to kind of try to position them away from my post and towards the back. So I'm going to come over this way. Dear Lord, these get heavier every day. Didn't help that it rained today. <laughs> and then I'm just going to drop it down in there like that. I'm going to get it as straight as I can. And I'm going to try to get it centered because I'm going to be pulling these posts together as much as I possibly can. But it can roll forward. It's not going to hurt anything. But I'd rather it, if anything, roll back like that. So I have the, the stub where a branch was grown off pointed towards the back of the fire pit. And that helps that kind of sit up straight. Now I have a gap there, which is okay, really, because I'm going to be packing dirt up against this. So remember what I always say, go for functional, right? And I'm trying to get the ends of these logs line up best as I can. Um, they're not all the same length. Later on, if you want to, you can take your saw or chainsaw and slice through them this locus. I'm not even going to mess with that. So my next biggest one is a very crooked one. I'm curious to see how this one's going to lay. And I think I'm going to put this stump, this branch down this end since I have that one up that end. Huffing and puffing like the old men that were getting to be, fellas. Ladies, I would never call you old. I know better. I'm married. All right. Okay, so we got that. Now I got a big gap there, and I have to ask myself, am I okay with that? Or do I want to try to flip this over and see if I can circumvent that gap? I think I'm okay with it. Once again, I'm going to be stuffing stuff in there. Get my axe safe. And then go for the next one. It's a bit smaller. Now, if you want to walk around and try really big, find really big logs, you're more than welcome to. But you don't need to. You don't want this to be monstrously heavy. It should be manageable for you. Okay? Put that one in there. Now I'm going to go for my last one. And I'll show you what we got, and then I'll show you how we're going to lash it. I don't know if this one's going to be long enough, but we'll find out. I think it's just, just, just long enough. Perfect. I'll take it. <laughs> Let me flip it over the other way. That's really, towards the end here, you're just kind of fine-tuning things a bit. All right, I'll take it. That one was a little bit short, but that's okay. So, let me get you turned around here. So what we're going to look for is any gaps. As you can see, there's a few. But for right now, we're in pretty good shape. It's as long as the fire pit is, right? And if you notice, if you look down here, I have a grill right in that keyhole. So when I pull my hot coals in there, I take that grill out, I pull my hot coals in there, and I just set that grill right on top of it. So basically, what you're going to do next is, I'm not going to do this right now, but you're going to put your dirt wall behind it. So you're just going to come in the back, and that's why we piled our dirt where we did. You're going to come in the back and just start pushing that dirt right up against those logs to pack them in. If you want that dirt mound to go as high as these logs go, go get more dirt. Because this ain't going to be enough for that. But, you want to pack them right up on top of that bottom log. And I'll show you in just a second. May as well keep the momentum going while you're still sweating. Because <laughs> you will. That's the whole point of one of these exercises. It's not just about learning axe skills and fire and all that stuff. A lot of it's about getting your body into shape, getting used to this kind of work if you're not used to it already. I know some of you guys do, and ladies do laborious type jobs, but a lot of us, like even me, sit in front of a computer a lot. I used to do this kind of stuff every day with my dad. I quit doing it for years. 
so I'm not in the best of shape anymore. And I'm just going to keep going until I'm happy with that dirt mound piled up on the back of it. I'm not overly concerned with filling every gap, but most of it. Notice I haven't uh, haven't lashed this yet. I'm talking to myself right now. I oh, know it wasn't. We're recording. I couldn't see. <laughs> I notice I haven't lashed this all together yet. I'm gonna wait until I get this dirt packed up against it. call that good for right now and if you need to add more later you can our primary concern is the lower part of this is packed with dirt so we created what's called an earth mound okay who am I breathing hard <laughs> so we got an earth mound on the back and that allows our fire, our cooking area, to get as hot as we need it to be. It's not about, trust me, that wood's not bouncing the heat back at us. It's really about keeping the heat within the fire pit so that fire will stay nice and hot and keep on burning. So this is a thermal wall backed by an earth mound. There ain't much heat getting out of that fire out the back. So when I build my fire towards the back of this pit, I'm in pretty good shape and you'll notice I didn't put the posts down inside the pit put them above it so the posts are four inches back from the edge of the pit you can go further if you want to and the log is about six to eight inches back from the edge of the pit which allows us plenty of room to make our fire without worrying about the thermal wall catching on fire so we have a good amount of space there. I'm generally gonna have my fire out here anyway, or off to the sides. But this is insulated pretty good. Now what else could I do if I wanna shore up the rest of these holes? Well, I could stick moss in there. I could pack mud in there and do whatever I want, right? The main body of this, this is what I'm concerned about. These first three to four logs, I want no gaps there. That's where I don't want any gaps and that's why I use the bottom part of the tree there. So, we're going to do something a little special with the lashing. A lot of times, guys will do just a X pattern lash back and forth here. I want to do something a little bit different myself. I want to squeeze these posts together as tight as I can, but that's kind of hard when you're, when you're trying to tie them with cordage. So I'm going to make a windlass for each side of this because over time, these logs are going to shrink. Wood shrinks, okay? Now the locust, not all that much. It won't shrink all that much, but it will shrink, which means my posts are gonna get loose up against these logs. So I wanna get these as tight up top as possible. They're already tight against my bottom log. I wanna be tight up top as possible. So I'm gonna create a windlass mechanism here and on the other sides. Dirt, really simple, but this is another lesson. You're gonna to wanna to journal this, okay? Journal this process that I've been showing you with the pilot stick and the wedging and the making points and the tools and how we stack the fire pit, how we dig the fire pit, your measurements you think you're gonna need about the dirt mound, remind yourself about that, shovel, maybe a small sledgehammer. If you need one, you can make a maul in the woods if you want to. But this windless contraption that we're gonna create, we're gonna use in another project very soon. So I'll familiarize you with it here where it doesn't seem as critical to you so in the future, when it is extremely critical, you'll be really good at it. And it's super simple. Just give me a second. All right, so here's what we're gonna need. We're gonna need a piece of cordage. Uh, depends on how wide your, your poles are. But I think I've showed you in the past, we're gonna tie what's called a fisherman's knot, okay? So we're gonna tie a loop around here, go over 
Let me get you closer here if I can. I'll try to. Uh, let me extend one of the tripod legs here. See if I can get you close enough that you can see. Yeah, you should be able to see there. Okay. So you're going to come make an X like that. Okay. You're going to bring your loop over and over the original string that it's part of down through and you're going to tie it so the end goes out this way you're just tying a, a simple overhand knot with the end pointed that way then you're going to take your other tag end and do the same exact thing over both Let's see if i can get this here so you're going to go you have your tag end you're going to go under this one then over both and come through the loop and tie it in the opposite direction. Then pull them. That knot's not going anywhere. Now, I could have made this a bit shorter, but that's okay. I think what I'll do is tie it off on the side over here a little bit just to shorten it up for time's sake. It's getting dark on me. And I can always What's nice about this method is I can use this cordage and I'm not using a lot uh, with the cross hatching and everything like that. It can get a little out of hand. What I want to do is take a stick, a solid stick, and I want to take it down through the strings. Let me move you back again. Make sure I'm in the shot here. There we go. That'll work. Okay, so here's my string. It's looped around these two posts. And I'm going to take my stick and take it down through. And this is critical. I'm going to turn it towards my logs, towards the inside of my firewall, my thermal wall. And I'm going to twist it, just like this. And I'm going to keep twisting it. And I'm going to keep twisting it. And I'm going to keep doing that until I feel that these posts are extremely tight. And I'll show you what happens next. Now, try to stay away from, if you can, try to stay away from any knots on this stick because you're going to need to slide this stick a little bit later on. So I'm going to keep twisting this until I'm really happy with how tight this is. I don't even care if this, this line doubles over on itself. I'm going to keep on going. And the reason it's critical that we're turning towards our firewall is because we're going to give this thing a twist and bring it down as low as our lowest log because we don't want it flying back in our faces. And this is what's called a Spanish windlass, okay? So if you let go of this, it just smacks the log. But it's holding these two posts extremely tight together. And with this bank line, I'm using number 36 Tard Mariner's bank line. I can go pretty tight with it. I can keep on going. Um, paracord can get slippery. With this kind of thing, it bites into what I'm putting it on, all right? So the next one, I might even do a little bit lower because I don't really like just that tip there like that. But it stops it. That's all I really care about. There's not a whole lot of force on this. But it's enough that if this thing spun free, it's going to hurt you, okay? So we want it down on there good enough so it's locked into place. And when you stand back and look at it, you'll see that it's holding those posts nice and tight together there, okay? So we're going to, now it's not going to hold it tight on this here because that log is very small, right? We had a smaller log there, but it's holding the bottom ones tight, and that's what I'm concerned with, is those are putting the most pressure on it. So all I'm going to do is come over to the other side, and I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to do that right here, okay? Now, you might be wondering, you know, why? Why not just lash it, you know, the, the typical way? Well, because it uses a lot of cordage, for one. Number two, like I told you before, these logs will shrink. Wood shrinks over time. Um, I've had firewalls like this, thermal walls like this, stand for a decade or more. Uh, there's some I built up at Ohio Powell, Pennsylvania, up in the mountains. They're there. Did they grow over? Did they rot? I don't know. Last time I was up here about three years ago, it was still standing. I made those when I was 14 years old. They're still standing. So if you got a hard enough wood and you've done this properly, and you've stacked it and you put your your uh, dirt mound behind it, your earth wall, that earth wall will grow grass and everything. It'll grow right up over top of this, all right? And it's just gonna seal it like the, it did with the old trapper's cabins and stuff. 
But the importance of the Spanish windlass method on this is simply when these logs begin to shrink and loosen up and things, I can adjust that. I can spin it a few more times to bring those posts in further. So anytime I feel it's just a little bit loose, I can spin those in and, and do it further. And that's why we want our posts decently in the ground. So with this last one, let's just measure real quick. And this is what I really like about this method is I can simply take my roll bank line. I do my first loop overhand knot with my tag end away from my other knot that I'm going to tie. So it's pointed out. Then I just simply look at the cordage and say, okay, that ought to be enough right there. So I'm not wasting anything, right? And if I need about three foot of cordage ever, I can pull it off of here real quick. Now I'm going to do the same thing, tie that overhand knot, going away from one another, pull them together. This time I'm going to bring that cordage down just a little bit further because this log wise at the end. And you can, if you want to make your windlass stick pretty or you want to take all the bark off your posts, feel free. Your posts will actually last longer with the bark off them. This is locust. I'll let that bark fall off of there. I'm not messing with it, right? So what I'm going to do is get this up here. Now this sticks a bit longer than the other one I had. So I'm simply, once again, I put my stick up through. I'm going to lay it on the back stick and I'm going to twist towards my thermal wall. All the while, I'm kind of sliding this thing up and down in between this Y here so I can position it where I want it when I'm done. Now, you can do it on an angle a little bit. If your logs aren't quite as tight as you'd like for them to be, you can do it on an angle, and you'll, you'll just breeze right through this. Now I'm going to keep doing this until it's as tight as I want it to be. And you get to watch or fast forward. It's up to you. But... I like to show it all because I run into problems sometimes and I want you guys, if those problems happen, I want you guys to see them. Like uh, some of the logs were crooked, there were some gaps, one log was too short, um, so I had to adjust for that a little bit. I want you guys to see that stuff. I decided to use a, a sledge, four pound sledge instead of making a mall. It's getting dark and I need to get this done and I'm tired and I'm hurting. So I had a sledge, I used a sledge, we'll make a mall the next time, right? If you're in a hurry for that sort of thing, you're kind of like, well, hey, I want to go out this weekend and I want to know how to make a mall, look up how to make a woodcraft mall on YouTube. You'll find 180,000 tutorials on how to do it. I will show how to do it, but if you're in a hurry, um, quite honestly, I'd look look up uh, uh, Dave Canterbury makes some, uh, Paul Sellers makes excellent woodworking mallets and things like that. Uh, showing mortise and tenon joints, and that's the way I do it, same exact way. Probably because I'm a protege of <laughs> Paul Sellers, so why wouldn't I? And I consider myself somewhat a protege of, of Dave Canterbury's too. I like, I like mimicking some of the stuff he does because it reminds me of a lot of the things that my family did. So if this, if this log gives me too much problems, I'm just going to turn it on end until I get this thing where I want it. That's the luxury of having that smaller log at the top. So I can just turn that thing on end, and I think that's tight enough right there. And then I could just reposition it, watching out for my other windlass, right back to where I want it. Make sure this one's in good shape, which it is. Actually adjusting that log helped a lot more. And now folks, look, I may have just done this, but if you're out in the woods, and you just did this, you made your keyhole fire pit, you made your thermal wall, you made your earth mound, and you did your windlass for your tensioning device, I want to tell you that you're, you're leagues ahead of a lot of folks out there. Uh, you're learning how to use axe control. That pilot stick, you're going to find out why that thing's important. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Building this thermal wall after doing all that work of cutting and moving those logs and wedging those sticks and pounding them into the ground and digging out that hole and putting all that dirt back on the back of it. And you, you tie that final windlass device, that tensioning device on your, your thing here, you're gonna be like, I did that. Like that's there to stay, I did that thing. You did that. You're doing that, that's you, okay? Um, in this video, 
I have a few friends that I would actually like to thank. Uh, one is Jamie Burley from Self Reliance Outfitters. Uh, the guy keeps giving me a, a go get them type of uh, go get them type of uh, let's say coaching of sorts. You know, saying man, people would love if you did this. Man, people would love if you did that. Man, you did that. I love that video. That type of thing. Um, Love them guys. Lee Collins, one of my great friends. You guys know that from packrules.com. Uh, Lee is always giving me encouragement and everything. When I go through the winter depression and stuff that I go through, Lee's always there. He's always talking to me. He's always giving me, um, you know, every bit of encouragement that I need. And even at times, the ass kicking that I need. Uh, next thing is, um, I have a few friends out there that are doing some uh, pretty heavy duty stuff. So I'm wearing a uh, Navy SEAL shirt to represent them um, and tell them thank you for the, your service and to all of you other active duty police officers, fire department, nurses, doctors, all of you that serve others and us, thank you so much. We really do appreciate you. For all you little kids out there, you're sitting here watching this with your mom and dad. Say hey daddy, hey mommy, hey pap, hey grandma, hey uncle, hey aunt, hey brother, hey sister. Let's get out in the woods and go dig a hole. Let's go cut some logs up. Let's stack those things. Let's make that windlass device. Let's pound those stakes into the ground. Let's start that fire. Let's cook dinner on that thing. Let's put a tent next to that. A few feet back. Don't get it too close, right? Go do this. What you'll learn, and this seems like a simple project. I keep saying it, and a lot of people are like, ah, plenty of people have done a fire pit. It's no big deal. You do this with your scouts. You do this with your kids. You do this with your brothers, your sisters. I don't care how old you are. If you've never been out in the, the field or you've never made something out in the field, go out there and make this. It's going to give you a sense of accomplishment. You're going to look at this. You're going to take pictures and you're going to have memories around that fire. When I say take pictures, I'm saying you and your friends and your family sitting around that fire, all aglow, drink, having a cold one, eating some kebabs, watching that thing glow, feeling the warmth with your tents all around, take a good group picture. And you know what? Do something people don't do anymore. Print that picture out. Put it in a picture frame, hang it on the wall, and cherish that memory. I'll see you next time. Take care.